My name is Anne Lagasse Dowson. I am a former two time federal NDP candidate broadcaster with 25 years of experience at the CBC. And I'm super happy to be online with the leader of the federal NDP, Jagmeet Singh, who's wearing a very beautiful pink turban, which I love very much. <laughs> and um, I'm calling, I'm speaking to you from Jojage, also known as Montreal, which is unceded Mohawk territory. Je vous souhaite tous et toutes la bienvenue. Parmi nous, cet événement se déroulera en anglais, mais on pourrait prendre des questions en français dans le chat, si jamais. Um, and I, I would just suggest that you consider the territory you're on. Uh, Non-Indigenous people need to confront our place on these lands, which is my way of addressing everybody across the country um, in various locations. Um, so uh, just without any further ado, Jagmeet Singh, I want to ask you right off the top, so as Pauline was saying, the CASA is the most significant move to expand healthcare in generations. How did it even happen? How did it even occur? Absolutely. Well, firstly, I got to say uh, one quick thing. There's a quote that I just read that uh, our universal healthcare is something that we have to be vigilant to defend. And that as soon as that we, as soon as it was built, there was always a threat as a, as soon as it was put in place that there would be encroachments and privatization. And that in that battle, the Canadian, Co the Canadian Health Coalition would be a key partner in pushing back against that. I paraphrased that quote, uh, but that quote was from none other than Tommy Douglas, who acknowledged that as uh, the founder of Medicare, how important the Canadian Coalition on Health and Healthcare is uh, and was at the time. And so I just wanna acknowledge that as the eighth leader of the same party, that I acknowledge that as well. And that's an incredible uh, burden and responsibility. I share it with you as, uh, as an ally in defending something I really believe in. Um, so to your question though, the, uh, the agreement actually came about uh, after having two back-to-back -back minority governments, my team and I sat down and, and we're thinking, what can we do to continue that tradition of new Democrats who use their power in a minority government to get something done that would make a difference in people's lives. And that was something I really was interested in. And, and so we actually approached the government right after the last election saying, this is two times back to back minority governments. Canadians are sending us a message. We need to do something that helps people. We had some conversations that didn't go anywhere. And the whole conversation was revisited. And what I think makes the story interesting and maybe beautiful in a way is that it was the birth of our daughter, Anha uh, Dekor, who when she was born, uh, triggered a phone call from the prime minister, that conversation then reopened the discussion around us wanting to get something done. And so I really <clears throat> look forward to telling Anhad when she grows up uh, that her birth was a bit of a trigger for what helped create the conditions for us to get to this point, which is which is an historic expansion of our healthcare system, the first of its kind since Medicare uh, at the federal level at least. And um, her name, we named our daughter Anhad, which means limitless. And we wanted her to have a limitless future despite the challenges that women often face. We wanted her to hear her name and to believe that she is limitless. And in a lot of ways, the, the agreement is inspired by this idea that what we want for our daughters, what we want for all kids, in fact, what we want for all people to be able to live a limitless future, not limited by the cost of medication and not being able to afford it, not limited because they don't have the money to access the healthcare they need. So uh, there's a lot of synergy with the name of our daughter, her birth and the agreement. So that's a little inside scoop for folks who are interested in some of the origin stories of some of the things that have happened in Canadian history. I think I'm not alone in saying I love that story. I mean, I think that is <laughs> poignant and lovely. And I mean, obviously the prime minister has kids, you have a daughter, many of us have kids and we would like to do well by them and leave them something better than what we've come into. But I, I just wondered, you mm -hmm. know, uh, quite apart from that lovely story about shared parenthood, you know, the old cliche about the liberals is they signal left and they turn right, they campaign on the left, they govern on the right. I mean, I'm wondering how, I mean, how are you feeling so far with the CASA? Do you feel that like enough progress is being made on these key issues? And I'm gonna stick to healthcare because we know it's a wide ranging agreement, right? It covers affordability, the climate crisis, a better deal for workers, reconciliation, democratic reform. But let, just to stick with health, like how do you feel it's going? Sure. So um, there is a very um, horrible uh, 
image that our health critic painted for us in describing how it has been to, to deal with the liberal government. Um, when we talk about what you framed that they are very much campaigning one way and then governing another way, that is absolutely true. So one of the things that we were really adamant, we wanted to get everything in writing. And so we can point to it and say, this is what we fought for. This is what we're forcing you to do. And these are the deadlines. We were really uh, in the negotiation. There was something that I was very passionate about. We needed to have deadlines. They were like, okay, well, generally you can commit to this. I mean, no, no, no. We need a deadline and we need a specific commitment. And so uh, the analogy, uh, I'm trigger warning, it, he's described it as um, wrestling with a, a pig that's been coated in some sort of oil uh, and you yourself are coated in oil and having to you know, hold on to this, grapple with this very slippery animal that does not want to do what was promised. So it's been a fight every step of the way. This has not been a, um, a collaborative uh, deal. This is something that we forced them to do. They literally voted against it a year ago. And now we're making them do what they voted against with the conservatives a year ago. So it has not been collaborative, but it's been very much driven by us. But I will give them the credit after lots of hard work and lots of pressure and forcing every step of the way, we met with the government over the summer regularly, worked all through the summer to get to this point, just with the, the interim part of the dental care. Uh, but we forced them to commit that we're only accepting this interim with the agreement of a, of a national federal program that will be administered federally for the rest of the phases. So uh, we really uh, had to fight for every step of the way, but I will like, acknowledge that despite the difficulty in getting to get this point, uh, we are meeting the, what we've forced them to do. We are meeting those parameters or meeting those deadlines. So the two big deadlines this year was the children under 12 for dental care. And we re remain flexible in how that would be delivered given that it was pretty, it was pretty ambitious to be able to put in place a national federal program within a couple of months, maybe five or six months, to, you know, from the time that we enter into the agreement and to the deadline, we, we didn't give us a lot of runway, but we wanted to be very ambitious and push. So um, the dental care for kids under 12, and uh, I know you said to focus on housing, but just the second piece was uh, a top up on housing. And we know that there's so many other elements of health that having good housing is, is related to health. But those are the two pieces that had to happen by the end of this year and are, are happening. And there's lots of work in place right now for the the formulation of that federally administered program for the rest of dental care. So we're optimistic. We know that it's not going to just happen on its own. We've got to fight every step of the way to do it. Uh, and the next big phase is going to be next year is also the framework for pharmacare. Again, something the Liberals had voted against when we put it in Parliament, something that their own recommendation or their own commission had recommended, but a Canada Pharmacare Act modeled after the Canada Health Care, the Canada Health Act is something that's also going to have to be delivered by next year. So there's a lot next year that we're going to be on top of the government to make sure they deliver. But so far, yes, it is a long-winded, yes, uh, we are getting progress and uh, with some caveats, but yes. So I, I just have to ask you this question. We know that Pierre Poilievre is now the leader of the Conservative Party, and he's described the CASA as, well, he said a bunch of things, but he called it a dangerously socialist, unholy union um, and what did he say also? Something about a radical wolf <laughs> coalition. Like, what do you make of those criticisms from the new leader of the Conservative Party? I, I think he's just trying to put a bunch of words together and I don't think he really knows what he's trying to say, but he just wants to say that he doesn't like it. Uh, and what we're gonna say is, well, he's gonna have to go to the 9 million Canadians who don't have dental care coverage, who can't look after their teeth and tell him why he thinks they shouldn't be able to look after their teeth. He's gonna to have to go to the millions of Canadians who can't afford their medication. And because they can't afford their medication are ending up getting more and more ill and ending up in hospitals and emergency rooms where they didn't need to be, but for the fact they couldn't afford their medication to stay healthy and explain why he thinks that's a good idea. So I, I want to really combat what he's trying to create a bit of a culture war. I want to make it about people and the people that are hurting right now because they can't get this access and people who really believe in our healthcare system and say, well, how are you going to tell, look someone in the eyes that doesn't have health care, that can't cover their medication, that doesn't have dental care, while you've had that coverage and your family's had that coverage and tell them that somehow they don't deserve it? I think he's going to have a hard time trying to make that argument. Uh, and uh, we're going to not buy into his, his games around uh, using different flashpoint words or, or trigger words. 
uh, and instead really make it about something that all Canadians agree on, a good healthcare system and making sure we've got, a, we take care of each other. I think most people would agree we're better off and we take care of each other. And that's what New Democrats are about. That's what the Canadian healthcare uh, coalition's about. How do we take better care of each other? And I think that's something that Canadians can get behind. Why not make the dental program universal? Because at the moment it's got a ceiling and it's being introduced in a phased in way, but why not go for universal dental? This is a really good question. Uh, we always uh, will hold to, um, especially in things like dental care uh, and healthcare, we want everything to be universal. We believe in it. I, I personally uh, experienced the, the challenges that come with not having financial resources. My family has gone through lots of ups and downs. I shared some of this in, in some personal stories, but my dad uh, struggled with addiction and uh, was a very successful physician. So for a good part of her life, this was not a concern, but then addiction took the, got, to the, got to a very severe point where he was not able to continue to work. And for about a decade and a half, was not working and we were uh, drowning in debt and uh, he had no resources. And he, the one day he decided he needed to get help he told the doctors he didn't want to die when he had been multiple times admitted into the hospital. And it was a for a not-for-profit publicly delivered rehab center that had a bed available in the city of Windsor that saved his life. And uh, I am so grateful to this day that that changed the direction of our whole family. And it was only because it was public and it was uh, something that it was not-for-profit and something that we could uh, admit him into at a time when we didn't have any resources. So I really believe in, in universality. I really believe in making sure that everyone has access. Uh, what we wanted to do was try to achieve something that was a first step, a, a down payment in the plan for a universal program. Uh, our, our pharma care is universal. The dental care, the challenge that we are up against is that there are a lot of existing coverages and we wanted to start with people who had no coverage and, and get that off the ground. And ultimately, we want to move to a, a universal program where dental care is rolled into our healthcare system seamlessly. Uh, but this is the down payment on that on that vision. So um, I'm wondering the the CASA commitment in the health section, Part Three, is about primary care. Uh, I'm wondering how you see that because I think probably a number of people who are on this call with us today are having difficulty accessing primary care, don't have a doctor, are on waiting lists, are really really frustrated. Uh, and I, we're hearing that frustration in the media continuously now. The chorus is getting louder and louder. I wonder what you would say to those people who are concerned about access to physician uh, care and primary care in general. Well, that was actually our first ask. Uh, in the negotiation, the first and foremost thing that, that we wanted to do was to defend what we have. Um, we, we really believe, and I really believe, it's not good enough to just defend what you have. We also have to expand it because our healthcare system is truly not universal in the sense it doesn't cover everything that it should cover. So we believe that we could do both, but uh, we could not get the government to agree to increasing healthcare transfers uh, in our agreement. That's something that we wanted them to do. That's something that we think needs to be done um, because we really want to defend what we have. So that's not to mean that we've given up on it. Um, just as an example, we fought to um, double the GST tax rebate so putting more money in people's pockets, that was not a part of the agreement. We've obtained that. That is something that we've been fighting for since the spring. We were told, no, no, we kept on fighting. And now that's been delivered as proof point for the fact that we can go beyond this agreement and ask for more and fight for more. And we will. And so uh, to the folks on this call that are wondering about accessing primary care, you're not alone. We've seen reports for the first time in a long time where many Canadians were unable to get primary care. Uh, and, and that issue that's been there for a while has gotten really bad. Now. We know there's a massive shortage of frontline healthcare workers. It's exacerbating that problem. And we know that we've got provinces that are, are very much open to, and in fact, trying to cater to uh, a privatization solution by creating a problem that they could have fixed, but by creating it and then suggesting the only solution is private care or privatization or opening it. Uh, that is a very dangerous direction that some conservative premiers are going down. And so, yeah, this is very important for us to defend it. Um, I think there's a lot of people that, are, that believe in the public universal model and we can defend it by properly having a federal partner that steps up with, with uh, understanding that this is a national crisis that we're in right now and there's a national solution needed. And that means not just the funds, but I also think strings attached. A lot of people are concerned that 
if the money goes to a province that is not going to spend it on healthcare and they end up using it for tax cuts, that's not going to solve the problem. And a lot of premiers have told me in, in confidence that they agree that if money is being spent, it makes sense that they have to be accountable for it. If it's supposed to be spent on healthcare, they have no problems at all in making sure that they can account for that. And so um, I, I'm, and, and uh, another interesting point, we already have a very easy framework for strings attached, which is the capital Act, which lays out five principles where the money should be spent. So that is already there. And, and I think it's something really important. I'm going to promise the next question is going to be less long-winded, but I just care a lot about the topic. <laughs> so I was going to ask you about the Canada Health Act, but before I do that, I'm going to let Pauline Worsfold, the chair of the Canadian Health Coalition, jump in and ask a question. Go ahead, Pauline. Uh, thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks, Jagmeet, for being with us here today. I don't know uh, what happened to my um, feed, but anyway, I'm back. And uh, my question, Rogers, Rogers' client. <laughs> oh, good question. No, I'm not. Okay. Um, actually, okay. I'm. Uh, my question is for the millions of uh, frontline workers and others, but them in particular. When we're talking pharma care, how can we at the front line? How can the general population advance the idea of a pharma care plan? Give us some pointers because. You know, we noticed that it's not being talked about very much, and we want to know how to kind of get it up on the agenda. Absolutely. So uh, we we focused on the first phase of of the agreement, and that was the dental care, and that that's starting this year. The second phase is next year. So this year's children twelve and under, next year eighteen and under seniors and people living with disabilities, and then expand it to the the rest of the population that has no coverage within a certain uh, income bracket. Um, so we focus on that first, but um, the next uh, next year, in addition to making sure we have this federally administrated program, the next big step is going to be the the national framework or the legislative framework for for pharmacare, which is the Canada um, Pharmacare Act. And that that act, we we actually took the the approach right out of the Hoskins Commission because. We looked at it very thoroughly, and it is exactly what New Democrats believe needs to happen, a universal, publicly administered um, pharma care program that has a broad formulary in the sense that a broad set of medication that, and, and other devices that are covered. So um, that, that is the next big step. So I would encourage folks to, to join us when we're going to be pushing and wrapping up pressure around that for 2023. So very soon, that's going to be the next big step that we want to see happen. And um, so please uh, feel free to amplify our messages when we're, when we're gonna come out on that. Um, we're gonna be meeting about the legislation and wanting to see that tabled. And then quickly after the next two phases of the Pharmacare that we have fought and forced this government to agree to is um, a formulary. So in that formula, we want it to be as broad as possible, looking at other countries with a broad formulary. And then finally a bulk purchasing plan. So a plan that would lay out how we could buy in bulk. And we're hoping with those three pieces in place, then all that would remain is then having provinces sign on. So we want to do all the heavy lifting and get everything set up and, uh, and, and follow the recommendations of the Hoskins report, which lays out a really clear path. And, and we're, we're hoping that we can lay out that path, make the case along the way, uh, show that this is going to benefit everyone. And really, one of the elegant pieces about the PharmaCare solution is that it's not a it's not an, an interference in jurisdiction at all. It's really just a combining of uh, purchasing power because every province already purchases a medication for cancer patients, for people that are in hospitals. So there's already purchasing that goes on at the provincial level. What we're really proposing with the National Pharmacare Act is let's combine our purchasing power, let's negotiate prices together instead of having separate hospitals and separate provinces negotiate. Let's negotiate together. Let's purchase together. And when we buy in bulk and we combine the buying power of the federal government as well as provincial and territorial, we'll not only be able to buy what we used to purchase and cover for free in, in hospitals, but we'll, we'll be able to cover a lot more and we'll be able to save people a lot of money. And I think that's another piece of the pharmacare that it's one of the, one of the few times where we can clearly show all healthcare provides some preventative measures. But with pharmacare, it's the probably the clearest path where we can show this will directly save just in the purchasing alone. It'll save provinces and territories money but, and the federal government money. But it'll also save in the sense that 
families will be able to take care of their health and not end up getting more sick and end up in the emergency room or the, the most extreme or acute versions of an illness because they haven't been able to maintain it. So there's lots of benefits. And we already know there's a number of provinces that would sign on. We've already, I, I've spoken with some premiers in the Atlantic and I, and I said, if this was available, and they said, we would absolutely sign on. And we'd say that publicly, UConn has already been public that they would sign on to a, a universal pharmacare. And so uh, we've got provinces that would sign on just like the Canada Health Act. And we'd start signing them up. And then other provinces would start saying, well, if they're getting medication for free in such and such province, why, why, sh why shouldn't we have it here? And I feel like we can eventually get that, get that victory. That would be, a, that's the dream. And that's that well, what we're working towards. So I'm going to I've, I've that. totally failed to do the short answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I wanted not... to add one quick thing. Uh, you said it would save money. And I want to just reiterate, it would save money and it would save lives. And Paul? Yes, I should have said that. Oh, nurse, charge nurse in a teaching hospital. Uh, I have a challenge for you, Jagmeet Singh. I want you to do a whiteboard TikTok on Pharmacare. Do you think you could do that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just like explain it. Yeah, I think a, so. A lot of people so. are like, wait, pharmacare, what drug? They're confused. And if you could just like draw, yeah. you know, like present it graphically and do what you just did, a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, okay, that's good. I, I get yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? This, uh, and such a great point. This is actually not, this was something that I've developed over the years because people are like, well, explain it to me. I don't get it. I don't think it's going to work. And then I'm like, well, what about this? And I'm like, that actually makes a lot of sense. That sounds like a pretty much of a no brainer. I'm like, this is the one time when it is so easy to make the case. Like we can make the case for a lot of things, but this one is the most direct. Like we've got this argument, which is a little bit harder to make that if we invest in long-term care, that it's gonna alleviate some of the pressures in hospitals. And people are like, huh, well, how, well because a lot of seniors are stuck in a hospital because they don't have a long-term care bed. It's a little bit, there's more steps to make the argument, but it will absolutely free up space in hospitals if we had good quality, not-for-profit, publicly delivered, good quality, long-term care home beds, then we wouldn't have seniors that are stuck in a hospital waiting for a bed and it would alleviate some of the pressure. That's a little bit of a harder kind of argument to make. The pharmacare one's easy. You're already buying it. They're already buying it. Let's all buy it together and it could be a lot cheaper and people would be healthier. Like it's a, it's perfect for a TikTok. So thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> and you could do a whole healthcare <laughs> TikTok series for the younger crowd because they're looking at the healthcare system and not not knowing how to even access the services and the care that yeah. they need. And I, so yeah. that's my next question. And somebody raised it in the chat too. How is it possible somehow to increase enforcement of the Canada Health Act? Could we put in place a complaint procedure or an ombudsman or something? Because the act is very clear and the feds are sidestepping it continuously. Yeah, I actually don't even think it's uh, it's additional tools. I think it's just the will because the tools are already there. The, the legislation provides some pretty clear oversight mechanism. There's some pretty flagrant violations going on already. And the government in the past has used it and it's been effective. So I think it's a lack of will. And, and I can, can commit to you, a new Democrat government would absolutely enforce the Canada Health Act. It could be a very powerful tool. And I also think that there's a lot of people that push back and say, Healthcare is strictly a provincial jurisdiction. And while the delivery is absolutely constitutionally provincial, it is actually a shared responsibility. The federal government has a responsibility. It was always planned that way. And if providing the finances is the responsibility of the federal government, it's also important to know where those finances are going and make sure they're going the right place and going towards the right vision, which is the universal, accessible, transferable, public administered system that that we all believe in and that was that was what we had agreed to so absolutely there can be more enforcement and it's really a matter of will i think uh, but but more tools always helps but i think the, the will is what's missing so to me like you know i i grew up in a ccf ndp family my dad was a union activist my mom was a women's movement activist like for me healthcare represents such a huge victory such an enormous achievement the national health service in england the healthcare system in Canada, and I, it just breaks my heart to hear people who are so defeatist, so, you know, it's so difficult, the system's not working, we hear the head of the Canadian Medical Association saying, oh, the system is collapsing, and I'm wondering how we could galvanize support, put pressure on the right pressure points, and move the system 
ahead and, and, and re, I don't know, rebuild confidence in this incredible achievement, which is healthcare. Well, I think it's folks like you, Anne, that, that type of passion in your voice, I think that's, that's something that people need to hear. Uh, I think um, there is a baseline level of support. And, and when you ask people, doesn't it make sense that you should be able to look after your family, your friends should be able to look after themselves, like the people you care about, your neighbor should be able to go in and be able to get the care they need. And it shouldn't matter how, what someone makes. So if someone's got lots of money, someone's got less money, it shouldn't matter. Most people kind of nod their head to that and they get that. And I think um, what we need to do is, is uh, a two part. One is I think we do need to show people that this is something that we fought for and we have to fight to defend. It's not just gonna, it's not just gonna on its own be there. There's gonna always be forces. Like I started off the quote from Tommy Douglas, it was always envisioned that there would be forces that prevented it in the first place, they wanted to stop it, and that there would be forces that would try to undermine it and erode it. And so the latter is what's happening now. So we've got to make sure people believe in this idea. And I think we can dig into this idea that when we take care of each other, we're a better society, we're better off as a community when we take care of each other. Um, and there's there's good economic arguments to be made that that it's it's more it's it's a better use of our public money when all of it goes towards care. If we're spending money on a private delivery, some of that money is going to go to profit. And I don't think people that doesn't sit well with them when we say, well, would you want your public money, your hard-earned money, going to enrich a shareholder of a wealthy corporation? I'm like, ah, oh, doesn't really make sense. And then we've got evidence, long-term care. We've got really good evidence, and and we can't let people forget. We saw the stark difference in Quebec and Ontario, particularly, that the the public and the not-for-profit long-term care homes had less a loss of life and far better conditions, far better outcomes. And in the for-profit, we had the military go in and they reported really ghastly things that had happened. These are folks that have seen war and they were uh, traumatized by what they saw that our, that our loved ones and our seniors are going through. So we've got great evidence to show. I mean, it's horrible evidence, but it's, it's compelling to show that profit in a healthcare model will mean worse outcomes. When, it, when there's a profit motive, there's going to be corners cut. And when all dollars go towards the care, we're going to have better care. And we've got proof of that. So I think that combined piece, we need to let people know that this is something we fought for. We've got to defend, let people know that evidence-based, it's actually a better better way to deliver. And that if we make better choices now, we can, we can reinvigorate what we already have and expand on it. So there's quite a lot of enthusiasm about the idea of a, a TikTok series in the chat. <laughs> I saw that too. <laughs> we'll have to, I'll have like, to give a credit to you, Anne. <laughs> just, but people are saying, give us tools, give us more tools to make the case, to make the argument, to spread the ideas that were the basis of Tommy Douglas's struggle. Because, you know, I, not so long ago here at the Canadian Health Coalition, we did a webinar with Nicole O'Byrne, who's a scholar of healthcare, and she she reminded us, you know, the doctors went out on strike in Saskatchewan. They walked off the job. They were so yeah. pissed off about healthcare <laughs> and people yeah. died. You know, like it's not, it was not a given. It was a struggle and it continues to be. So I'm just like, one of the things we're also doing at the Canadian Health Coalition is we've launched a campaign, which is the brainchild of our policy director, Steve Staples, the Hope and Health campaign where we're trying to bring people into the work that we're doing. But I, we, we really... We're really trying to galvanize on our side. I'm just wondering, what are the key pressure points, do you think, for people who want to do something? I mean, you're going to say join the NDP, and that will make perfect sense. But what else, what else do people <laughs> do? You know, apart, you know, apart yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, we, we need to make sure people feel like, so there's a political, there's, there's the decision making around healthcare is going to, is going to be political. Hey, there's, there's people in power that are going to make decisions. So there's an element of this organizing that has to be political. And there's two parts that support the people that have the vision that you agree with. So I would, again, and you, you anticipated, definitely support, support the New Democrats are, are, are proud defenders of our healthcare system. So you anticipated, I would say that, but also, you know, make it, make it aware through, through public pressure that there will be a price to be paid for anyone in power now that, that erodes that system. So there's also that, that threat. If, if uh, most, e even some of the worst politicians, most of them, especially ones that are in power, understand that if they're gonna lose their power, they're gonna lose their votes over something, 
it will it'll give them pause. So if there's enough of a public outpouring of saying, we reject this approach and we get a lot of people behind it, it, it will it will give pause. So I think there, there's that's an element we need to put, people have to get out there and say that. How do you say that? There's lots of ways. So if um, letters to, to offices make a big difference, so writing letters to each of the members of parliament, provincial parliament uh, in, in the province of Ontario where Doug Ford is openly privatizing, having people come out and, and writing letters, make sure they're not form letters, that they're, that they're unique. So then someone will, like, we, we can clearly, clearly tell, like I get lots of form letters, I can tell it's a form letter, but when it's like a, someone from my writing and it's, it's written in their voice or not in a form letter format, and I get a bunch of them, then that's something that's a local issue I'll start to pay more attention to. So writing the letters, uh, sending emails, phone calls, showing up at people's offices, like these are great ways to put pressure and say, this is the wrong approach. We want our system to be public. We don't want to have private care being brought in. I think that's important. Uh, supporting the NDP so we can form government and make sure we protect it is, is very key. Uh, public support, like getting people to believe that this is important, like sp spreading the word, letting people know, sharing messages that that, sh that highlight how private care is bad in the sense that it, it will create a divide and it will mean less less out less positive outcomes for most people uh you know sharing those messages putting that out there saying it in really simple terms like when when we spend money on private care some of that money is going to profit i don't want to be putting our public dollars towards profit i want to put it all towards care uh, i think those are really compelling arguments and letting people know about that is it possible somehow in the context of the house because the house uh sits start sitting again on the 19th is it possible somebody in the chat has brought this up now twice how is it possible to shame the liberals i mean we have the canada health act it's a very powerful tool yes and they basically ignore it so can it be is it possible for you in the caucus and the caucus to just go after them on that yes yes absolutely and sorry i was focusing on the provincial but yes federally we can't let the, the federal government off the hook it is absolutely a national problem and the liberals are in power and could absolutely uh, increase funding with strings attached, could enforce the Canada Health Act, could immediately crack down on where there's, where there's encroachment happening and has power to do so. So we absolutely, are, that is something that we've been, we've been doing and we've, we've, we're gonna continue to do. And I encourage you all to do it. There's a provincial level to this. There's absolutely a federal level. And that federal is a very powerful tool if, if the government chose to, to, to actually enforce a universal public healthcare system and make sure provinces aren't using, or aren't, aren't allowing private care to come in. We have ways to defend against that. There's penalties, there's withholding of funds. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, I mean, that last property tool is, is the most severe, but um, there are ways and absolutely we should be shaming the federal government into action. Um, I'm wondering also, uh, just to mention, you were talking about the provinces, people can also join the provincial and territorial health coalitions, which are allied to the Canadian health coalition. So in each provincial jurisdiction, there are people fighting yes, please. privatization in the context of these coalitions. The other thing uh, it's mentioned in the chat, but I just mentioned, um, we're at great pains, the staff of the Canadian health coalition to put out a weekly update on issues of interest on healthcare. And uh, we really encourage people to subscribe to that. We do it in both English and en français. Uh, ce n'est pas du tout le même fil, les mêmes informations. We have a pretty lively Twitter feed too. So maybe just check us out and sign on because we try and take the news and cook it up into a formula that's easy to understand for people who are a bit overwhelmed by what's going on. Because the, the news just seems to be continuously bad. And uh, it's not. There are lots of things that are going on that are really encouraging. So please do sign on to our newsletter. I, I, I do think, though, that shame, like the liberals do seem to operate in a very performative way. So I think shaming them is actually a, a decent strategy. But I wonder how you balance the need to do that with the fact that the message of the conservatives under the leadership, the new leadership of Pierre Poilier is government is bad, taxes are bad, public programs are bad, everything is bad, be very afraid. Like, so... How do you neutralize that? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really important question. I think what we can underestimate, one of the things that, that uh, Pierre is doing that's, that's good, is connecting to people's frustration. And I think what often progressives, people on the left, people in the left coalition, 
uh, of, of thinkers and, and folks that care about you know, a society where we're based on taking care of each other and looking after one another. Uh, the, the thing that we don't do enough is acknowledge the anger. It, it, is, it is fair and legitimate for people to be angry and frustrated. But then this is where we have a really important responsibility is that we have to channel that anger and frustration into a positive action. And the difference with us and the right is they don't really have to do that. They just kind of say, everything is bad and people are nodding and let's tear it all down. And they continue nodding. And it's a pretty simplistic solution. It's actually not gonna make things better for them, but it's a very easy path to follow. I hate everything, tear everything down. Uh, our, ours is a little bit harder and often the, the better path is often a little bit harder. And so we have to not jump over the anger. We have to appreciate it, acknowledge it, connect with it. Say it's, it's fair that people are frustrated. They can't get the care they need. It is really frustrating if you can't find a family doctor. And the reason why you can't find that is because you've got a federal government that's not willing to step up and you've got provincial governments that are eroding investments in our healthcare. We can do better. And then, and then really channel that towards a solution. And our path is a bit harder because again, we're, we're actually trying to solve things. But I, I think the way we can, we can do a better job of getting to the solution is not jumping over the immediate frustration and anger people feel. And I feel like we sometimes are too much focused on the hope and the solution and the policy. And we should take a little bit more time to focus on the frustration and the anger. And then, yeah, someone said anger to empower action. I think that's, that's our difference. Like if you look, yeah, look at it, a lot of activists, a lot of people that fought, fought from a place of love for sure but they also fought for a place of indignation and anger and frustration. And they channel that to making things better for people. And I think we need to do a bit more of that. I think that's one of our challenges. And the other really important thing is, and, and we've been doing this a bit more is when, when Poirier talks about cutting things, we have to talk about what that, what's that gonna mean? Because he's not hiding from that. If he says he's gonna cut healthcare, that means that you're gonna have less access to a family doctor, not more. If he says he's gonna cut, cut government spending, that means you're gonna have less, you're gonna to have to wait longer in an emergency room. And I think that will take away some of the, the fire behind what he's saying. And we say, well, well, what he's saying is actually gonna make things worse. He's literally proposing a solution that will make what you're frustrated about even worse. Uh, I was actually at a factory with workers and they were a factory in Thunder Bay and they produce uh, the rail cars, the subway cars, that, that public transit. And they said, the workers there, blue collar, good paid workers said, we need investment in public transit. And so I said in a press conference, these workers here told me they want investment in public uh, transit because that's what's gonna help people, help communities, but also create jobs for this community. This, this factory, this huge factory that employs up to 1200 people can only run if there's actually projects being built in infrastructure. Well, Pierre Polyev cuts government spending on infrastructure like public transit, these workers are gonna lose their jobs. And I think that's the way to say like his stuff is not a vacuum. It's actually going to have the outcomes, which is going to be worse for people, for the people that he's trying to say that he's defending. And I think that that'll help us. And we're, we're as you can see, we've been putting some time into these, into these arguments and trying to make really good ones that are, that can get people head nodding and say, yeah, that makes sense actually. This guy I think has caught a lot of people off guard because of his support of the convoy. And as you say, this kind of everything is terrible, tear it all down. And I think the healthcare file, because it is more complicated, more detailed, that's where sim as simple as possible messages are super important and very difficult. So I'm wondering, what do you think your allies, your organizational allies, like you mentioned what people can do, individuals can do, but what do you think the Canadian Health Coalition and the various organizations that form it. The, the, we're talking about big, uh, like the Canadian Labor Congress, Unifor, QP, I mean, very important, very wide ranging organizations, the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions, which Pauline is one of the heads of. How can we create critical mass to push forward on this when we're facing this, what's, what seems to be a growing crisis? So, um... We, we need to all be, be in that same kind of framework around understanding the frustration, connecting with that, and then providing a real solution and, and giving people hope. I think hope is the really big distinguishing factor between, between our approach, like the progressive approach and the, the kind of the right wing approach. The right wing is anger, flame the anger, tear it all down. Ours is anger, which leads to action, 
but really with the underlining hope. And hope is something that people can connect with. People at the end of the day do want to hope. Like there is a, there is an ingrained part of us as humans that we want to hope for the better. We want to, we want to hope that things will get better tomorrow. We hope that, you know, the rain will go away and the sun will start shining. There's something very basic in us that we, we want that. We want to believe in that. And we have to give people hope. And I think the organizations can really provide. Um, one of the nurses I was speaking to was worried that if we, if she doubles down on this idea that we're in crisis, it'll just fuel the, okay, if things are so bad, then we've got to privatize. And so she was in a bit of a conundrum. And I think the conundrum is we have to acknowledge, like people are frustrated with health care workers are frustrated. Things are bad. And that's okay to, to acknowledge that. But to say, but but things could be better. And, and there's so many solutions. And there's so many ways we could immediately make it better. Here are some of the things we can do right now that would make things better. And I think we, we have to always inject the hope into each message. So it's not just that everything's bad. Everything's bad. It's the fault of, of decisions made by government, not government itself, but their decisions. They make a bad decision. Government can make good decisions and actually make things a lot better. So like we have a little bit of nuance we have to work with. And, and I just encourage everybody to, in your own ways, that general idea, connect to the frustration, target that frustration and anger towards the decisions that are being made, not necessarily the institutions, because we don't want people to lose hope in the fact that a government could actually make things better. That's more the conservative side, that the kind of governments are just inherently bad. And they're going to take away your freedoms and take away the things that you care about, that whole frame. Um, and if I could add one aside, folks uh, are absolutely should be and are probably preparing to take on uh, Polyev. What I would I would counsel against is there's a bit of a trap that he's setting up. He wants to and and so he wants to create this culture war uh, with little attacks here and there where he says things like the woke radical left and and I was asked this by a bunch of media in a good way, like a bunch of, like a lot of media outlets were asking this question. And the bait that he was setting up, and it's not the media's fault at all, it, it would be my fault if I took the bait. The bait that he's setting up is that all people want to hear from me. If I was to say, well, he's a crazy convoy guy, and that's all they hear from me. And on the other hand, he takes these one or two shots and shakes hands with, you know, he is definitely in line with some scary folks. But if if the only thing that the, that the, that the left says about him is that he's scary and, 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 and crazy, or he's a hardcore right wing. And what they hear from him is one or two of those things, but most of his time talking about the frustrations of Canadians, they'll sort of say, well, this guy's talking about my frustrations and the left just says that he's crazy. And so that is a trap. And so what we have to talk about is the, the, the impact of his decisions, how he's gonna cut healthcare or is cutting government spending is gonna cut healthcare, it's gonna make it bad for your families. So that we're talking about, we want to make it better for families with better health care, not that he's a crazy right wing. That's the trap I think that uh, that he is setting up very skillfully. And we are not going to take, well, I'm definitely not going to take the bait. And I want everyone else to not take the bait on that, that that those, there will be times we have to absolutely call out some, some you know, tr problematic things that he's doing, but that can't be the only thing we say about him. It has to be back to I would like to frame uh, one of my dear friends and one of the best communicators in the country Marie Del Matteo who's been a mentor to me was always like we got to make it about people that's that's our superpower we make it about people and the impact on people so most of the time we should be talking about the impact on people sometimes we can talk about you know the things that he does that needs condemning but anyways that's a I went really down the path of political strategy there but I think that's an important <laughs> I think it is actually, it's very useful to hear it expressed so clearly because it is tempting because he has such an annoying kind of polarizing approach. It's easy to see yes. that. So that's very good advice. Now we promised we'd let you go at 1245. So we're hitting, we're at 1246 right now. Oh um, boy, I didn't notice. Time ah. is so good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is so great to talk to you like this. I find it really empowering. Um, and there's so many other issues, but I think we'll stick to our promise and try and maybe book you again, maybe like in six, yeah. two months or something. Would that be yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, I, I would love to do it. This is great. This is lots of fun. It's great to speak with allies. I have to sometimes speak with people that uh, are not always seeing eye to eye, and that's okay too. I need to do that as well. But it is a, a treasure and a pleasure to be able to speak with people that are allies in a common goal for building that type of Canada that I think we all know is possible. We want to see happen. And we want to defend it and make it better. And it's nice to be able to spend time with you all. So thank you very much to Jagmeet Singh, to Ali Chatur, Alison Koa, James Chapman, and Joe Govan, who is a good friend to the CHC. 
um, to yes. Pauline, to Steve Staples and to Tracy Glenn, who's been stick handling everything behind the, the scenes in such an adept way. And thank you so much to all of you who've joined us today. And, you know, keep the faith and remember that great speech that Tommy Douglas gave about the new Jerusalem without falling back on scripture, the idea of building something that is hopeful. And uh, maybe join us later as we develop our Health and Hope campaign at the Canadian Health Coalition. And I'll just let Pauline close today's proceedings. But once again, a grand, grand merci à tous et à toutes. I don't know what else I can add, and. <laughs> Uh, you've done it all. I do want to put another plug for our Health and Hope campaign. Uh, the Canadian Health Coalition is launching, and uh, it's just about that, health and hope. And uh, we have framed it around the CASA agreement, and uh, we hope to get um, good results from the uh, NDP Liberal CASA agreement. Uh, we're calling it Health and Hope uh, 2025. Challenge accepted. More TikToks. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. I look forward to seeing that TikTok uh, yeah, yeah. on Pharmacare. Yes. You, will, you will see it. And a huge thank you to, to Anne and to Pauline for the hosting and uh, the chairing. It was really well done. I think you made a really, I can see in the comments, people really enjoyed uh, your, your style of keeping the conversation going. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank Thanks, everyone. It's like you're a journalist or something. Oh yeah, geez. <laughs> We're not as bad as people think. It's like you're it's like you're doing something that you're good at or something. <laughs> merci, right, merci take beaucoup. Care. Take bye care, everybody. Talk to you again soon, I hope. Merci, bye bye. Merci, au revoir. Au revoir.